everyone, and welcome to episode 16 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. It's inevitable. If you have a conversation about the Middle Ages longer than 30 seconds, somebody is going to bring up torture. From Iron Maidens to dungeons to drawing and quartering, everyone knows, or thinks they know, that torture was an integral part of medieval life. But believe it or not, much, if not most, of what popular culture and even school books tell us about medieval torture is actually myth. To tell us more about the real world of medieval torture, I've invited Dr. Larissa Cat Tracy, Professor of Medieval Literature at Longwood University in Farmville, Virginia, and a serious expert on getting medieval. Cat is the author and editor of many books, including Torture and Brutality in Medieval Literature, Heads Will Roll, Decapitation in the Medieval and Early Modern Imagination with Jeff Massey, Wounds and Wound Repair in Medieval Culture with Kelly DeVries, and Medieval and Early Modern Murder, which came out last year. Her forthcoming edited collection is Treason, Medieval and Early Modern Adultery, Betrayal, and Shame. Here's our conversation on when and how people were really tortured and executed in the Middle Ages. A lot of it may surprise you. Well, thank you so much, Kat, for joining us to talk about torture today. Thank you so much, Danielle. It's my pleasure to be here. I wanted to start with a distinction that you make in your book on torture and brutality, which I think not everyone makes when they think about the Middle Ages, and that is the difference between torture and judicial brutality. So what's the difference between those two things? Essentially, torture is a part of a process where punishment is the end of that process. So, for example, if you need to extract an, a confession or get information out of somebody, then the application of pain to do that would be torture. If you are doing something to someone who has already been found guilty or that you have already judged to be guilty, then it technically isn't torture, it's punishment. Now, punishment, of course, can include extrajudicial brutality. It can include atrocities that fall outside of any sense of sanctioned violence. So when we talk about medieval torture, torture itself is a strictly regulated and very specific process that was only introduced into medieval law in 1215. It starts to come into the conventions and conversations about law in the late 12th century. And there's a debate against it as well. But it's really not part of canon legal procedure until 1215. Yeah, I think people have this idea about torture in that it's kind of arbitrary and it's used against everybody. Um, but it really wasn't that arbitrary. It was very, very uh, specific in how it was applied. So yeah. where did the idea of using torture as a way of getting confessions, for example, come from? Roman law, specifically. And in fact, I guess to your point about everybody kind of wanting to see something that is horrific or atrocious as torture, and of course, just the adjective, that's torturous, it creates this misimpression about a very specific legal process. Now, when the church was re rediscovering Roman law in the early 13th century, the late 12th century, they were trying to replace a system of ordeals. And of course, an ordeal was more about determining guilt or innocence than it was about finding out truth. And that is truth with air quotes, because the whole process of determining what actually happened was called inquisitio. So it's inquisition is about discovering the truth. And in order to do that, you needed a confession. Ordeals relied on a process of accusation. So you have accusatio and inquisitio. The accusation process essentially ran where somebody could accuse someone of a crime and it was up to that person to prove they hadn't done it. And some, in some ways, the ordeal was a test of their guilt or innocence based on things like sticking their hand in hot water grabbing an ingot at the bottom of a boiling cauldron of hot water, sticking their hand in the fire, undergoing some kind of ordeal. And their hand would be taken out of the fire or the water and bound and, and treated. And if the hand started to heal, the person was innocent. If it didn't, then that was seen as the judgment of God that they were guilty. 
Now, I'm oversimplifying the process of ordeals, but what happened with ordeals was it was very arbitrary. Trial by combat is actually an original form of ordeal as well. And of course, in that case, it's not really about who's guilty or innocent. It's about who fights better and who can withstand the stamina and the energy of that fight and come out victorious. And so church officials, especially, and some secular courts felt that that was not a fair way to actually judge people. They felt that they needed to discover the truth. And so Roman law included the provision for applying torture to get the queen of proofs, which is a confession. I think that's a really good point that you make about ordeals, because I think that, you know, if we look in media and we see people going through ordeals in terms of a medieval type story, everyone just believes in the outcome and it's definitely from God. And and really people were very skeptical about ordeals and how they turned out. And they knew you could kind of rig the system. So it was something that they were kind of suspicious about, I think. Yes, absolutely. And people were suspicious about the application of torture as well. That's one of the reasons that it is regular particularly in ecclesiastical contexts, because everyone likes to think of the Inquisition with a capital I, Bernardo Gui tromping along Europe with a wagon full of torture implements like in the name of the rose. But inquisitorial courts were actually very specific, were very localized, and the regulations for applying torture in the course of confession were very specific. So if somebody confessed, you couldn't apply torture. It was then up to decide whether or not you were going to perform punishment and what that punishment would be. The most common use of torture in Europe is in the 13th century is the accusations of heresy. So when people were accused of heresy, if they didn't confess, torture could be applied. But torture could only be applied if there were already two half proofs against that person. So you couldn't just arbitrarily say, I accuse you of heresy, torture them to get them to confess. You had to have evidence first. And even then, not everybody could be subjected to torture. So what kind of evidence would you have to have if you were going to apply torture to get that last confession? Well, it depends on the actual accusation itself. If it's heresy, you might have to have eyewitness proof of somebody saying or behaving heretically. You might have to have written proof. But of course, depending on the literacy of the person involved, that may not may or may not be an actual possibility. So you had to have generally eyewitness accounts that said, yes, I know that this person has engaged in this behavior that is heretical. But... Those witnesses had to be credible, and they had to be people of good reputation. And if the accused was also a person of good reputation, torture very often could not be used at all. That's a really interesting point, I think. And it's a good one to make because even with these strict regulations, they weren't the same all over, and they weren't the same depending on the case. So. Correct. What kind of differences do you see if you look at a picture of medieval Europe as they start to implement torture as a way of getting confession? What are some of the differences that you see across medieval Europe in in how it was applied? Well, each authority has its own jurisdiction and its own laws regarding the application of torture and punishment. So you have canon law, which is supposed to cover Christendom in medieval Europe. But of course, it's not a monolithic thing. It's not always evenly applied, even though the law was consistent. Then you have secular law, and secular law dealt with it differently. So torture was applicable in France. The French king could absolutely, by less majesty, by the right of the king, he could order somebody to be tortured. And particularly in the case of the Knights Templar, Philip the Fair does that, and he does it in conjunction with the Pope. So they use the papal inquisitors to fulfill the wishes of the secular monarch. However, in places like England, England did not allow torture because of common law. So torture was illegal in English common law throughout the Middle Ages. Now, the king could still exercise less majesty, and if he really wanted to, he could order that somebody be subjected to torture. But I've only come upon two instances where the king himself is associated with it, and they are not positive accounts. He's being criticized for having gone too far. 
Right. And even with the Templars, it took a lot of pressure for Edward to agree to allow some of the Templars to be tortured in order to get confessions because they weren't getting any confessions. <laughs> Exactly. And in fact, Edward, Edward II stands by common law and says, we're not doing this here. And the inquisitors write letters back to the Pope and say, could we please move these interrogations over to the territories in France where we have more jurisdiction and where we can use torture? They essentially wanted these Templars to be renditioned because they were not confessing to anything, because they were not being subjected to torture. And there's actually a letter that circulates in 1308 that was written in Paris, um, possibly by an eyewitness of the torture of the French Templars, essentially written to the bishop in Durham, arguing that they should not in England be using this, that the torture of the Templars was wrong, the torture of the Templars was excessive, and that it led to injustice. So even at the time, there were voices of dissent. Not everybody thought that this was a good idea. In fact, many, many people did not. Right. And they suspected that the confessions that you got under torture were not necessarily valid anyway at the time, because they realized that someone would say anything to make it stop. Absolutely. And that's become a constant in even the discussions of the legal application of torture today about whether or not any information you get under torture is valid. Can you trust it? Because people are going to say whatever they can to make that kind of pain stop. And they were aware of it in the Middle Ages. And this becomes part of the cry for outlawing it in other places later in the 17th century. The only time torture is legal in England is between 1540 and 1640. Henry VIII brings it in post-Reformation as he is developing his strategies for the separation of the church from the church with Rome, but also when he's persecuting his own political enemies. Yes, coincidence? I think not. <laughs> no, not <at> no. <laughs> so when we actually look at the type of torture that was applied in the Middle Ages, especially against the Templars, it isn't Iron Maidens, is it? No, it's not. No. And in fact, if, if an Iron Maiden actually existed, it would not have had spikes. It was not designed to skewer somebody inside because, of course, that would kill someone. And killing them is not the point. If you have killed somebody in the course of torture, you have violated the process and you're left with nothing. Because if you kill someone in the process of torture and they haven't confessed, then you have no proof that they even deserved punishment. And there were laws that could hold the judge responsible if they ordered torture and the prisoner died during the course of it. So the judges had some liability for making sure that person didn't die. But Iron Maidens are a lovely 19th century fantasy of what the Middle Ages and medieval torture was. In fact, most torture museums, if you go to any of them, the implements that they have, if they are reconstructions, they are mostly reconstructions of 16th century implements, some of which may or may not have actually been used in the process of torture. The Iron Maiden, if, if it was ever used, it was a containment unit. It was almost like a small prison cell that you'd be stuck in for a couple hours as public humiliation and as punishment for things like slander. And it, it is not designed to actually cause you physical pain necessarily. <laughs> it defeats the purpose. And to cause physical pain, this is something that I talk about when people ask me about Iron Maidens. You don't actually need something elaborate to do that. And when they were torturing people like the Templars, they weren't using elaborate means to do that. So what kind of things would they do to try and extract a confession? Well, with the Templars specifically, because we're talking about 1307, you know, the, the images you see of something like the rack are usually these very sophisticated mechanisms with winches and wheels, and you turn them and, it, and you've got diagrams that would take an engineer to build. The Knights Templar who were racked, essentially had their hands bound above their head and the rope was thrown over essentially three poles and a weight would be attached to their feet and the rope would be pulled from the back. And so they would be pulled between the tension of their hands and the weight on their floor. And that is essentially the first form of the rack that was used. And the idea of a rack was to 
dislocate the joint. Now, they came up with some more sophisticated ways of doing this. You see images of the Judas Cradle, which is a wooden pyramid that is on legs, and the prisoner is suspended from ropes on each wrist and each foot separately. So spread eagle over this wooden pyramid. And the idea is they would be lowered onto the pyramid naked. And so that the pyramid would penetrate either vaginally if it was a woman or anally if if it was a man. I don't actually know if this was ever actually used. (laughs) I have certainly come upon references to it, but a lot of those are later references. So if you needed to apply torture, if you were in a circumstance where you didn't necessarily have a torture chamber. In fact, those are largely apocryphal modern constructions or even early modern constructions of what medieval was because you didn't need a torture chamber. You needed rope, you needed hot irons, you needed a few implements here and there that could pull flesh and that's all you needed. So even this concept of tossing somebody in a dungeon, most castles don't have dungeons either. They have storerooms and you can toss somebody in a storeroom and deprive them of food and water perfectly easily without actually having to have a specific room to do so. And what happens in this, particularly in the 19th century, the medievalism and anachronism that constructs this idea of the Middle Ages as something brutal and horrific so that we can feel better about ourselves in the modern period It is actually those more modern audiences that come up with the worst medieval torture devices because it was pretty simple. Yeah, that's so true. And I do want to come back to that in a minute. But when we talk about people who were applying torture in order to get confession, who are we talking about? Because I think we have this impression there's a big executioner, he's got a big hood, never a shirt, but a big axe and a big hood. (laughs) Who is it that would be applying torture in order to get confessions? Well, depending on the kind of court, if it's an ecclesiastical court, priests might be the ones who are specifically designated to interrogate and apply torture, except that they were forbidden from shedding blood. The Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 also said that they could not shed blood. That's partly why you see the application of hot irons, because hot irons don't draw blood, they cauterize a wound. The church found a way around that by having allowing priests to absolve each other if they did draw blood in the course of torture. Now, throughout the proceedings of ecclesiastical courts, it would have been a religious brother responsible for applying the torture. In secular courts, it would be whomever was designated by the king as the interrogator. If you read accounts of the torture of people like Anne Askew, who's a Protestant martyr in England. And she she talks about her torture. She describes it. And John Fox explains what happened. It is simply the authorities of the sheriff and the king who are on hand, who are applying the torture. It wasn't someone's specific job. Now, an executioner is a different matter because executioners often were hooded, but that was simply so that their identity was protected. Yes. And that was more not for torture, but for punishment. punishment And when we talk about using these brutal techniques, for example, to either get a confession or later to punish, we're not talking about garden variety crimes. Like we're not talking about jaywalking. We're talking about more serious things. So what kind of crimes would you have this applied for? Usually the, the most grievous crimes. So for the church, that would be heresy. And again, heresy for the church was this idea that you were potentially falling into sin and you were violating the tenets of the religion. So torture could be applied in those circumstances. For secular crimes, murder and treason predominantly. In fact, many of the crimes that people assume torture could be applied to also assume that capital punishment was the ultimate punishment. Capital punishment is relatively rare in the Middle Ages. And the accounts we have are the most visible accounts, which is why we know about them, because they're the most visible accounts. Also, authors, literary authors, had a tendency to take poetic license. And if you want, if you have a traitor in a text, you want the worst thing you can possibly dream up done to them. That doesn't mean that that was actual practice. So far more often what you see is the capacity to torture for confessions of murder, for treason, for heresy. Adultery is not one of those things for which you could torture someone. 
because you had to catch them at it first. And you had to quite literally catch them at it. In the Custom d'Argen, which is a French 13th century customary law, it actually spells it out that if, if you wanted to catch someone in adultery, the couple had to be caught in flagrante delecto by two judges, not just two people, two judges. They had to be at it. The two judges had to catch them at it. <laughs> And then if the if the man could flee at that point, he would often be allowed off. If he couldn't <laughs> flee at that point, then he and the woman might be taken naked, bound back to back, and forced to walk through the town. And people would be allowed to throw things at them, shout things at them, and there would be trumpets blaring because it was about public humiliation. It's the exercise of of shame. So if you imagine Circe's walk of fame, or rather her walk of shame in Game of Thrones in season five, that is essentially the punishment for adultery in sections of Europe all throughout the Middle Ages. It was about public humiliation. Now, once that was done, somebody who had committed that crime and been publicly humiliated for it would lose reputation. Their public reputation, their publica fama would actually suffer for it. So then they became more likely to be accused of other things because now they were a person of bad reputation. And then if they committed another crime of some kind, torture might be applied in those circumstances. But you had to do something pretty bad for anyone to bother torturing you in the first place. I think what a lot of people think about is the later application of torture and the later application of the capital punishment. When you get to the 16th, 17th, 18th century, that's when England allows capital punishment for all kinds of stuff and for lesser crimes as well as greater crimes. But in the Middle Ages, it was fairly rare. Yeah, in the early modern period, it's so funny how they're saying, look at how awful this was in the time before us. In the meantime, it's worse in a lot of cases in the early modern period than it is in the medieval period. And I like what you said about how we see examples of brutal punishment and they stick out because they are meant to. And the other ones, if somebody was, was given capital punishment for a crime, usually murder or something like that, you don't really see it because it wasn't spectacular. You do see torture, you do see brutal punishment in literature, but you've mentioned in your book that this isn't necessarily condoning it. It's in the literature because people are trying to make a point. So what kind of point were people trying to make when they put torture or brutality in literature? Well, as in all things, it's subjective. And I think a lot of literature can be read either way. But what I found when I was looking at instances of torture particularly for torture and brutality, it is generally cast as something that other people do, a barbarian other. It's not us. We don't do this. So you actually find a lot of references to torture and to excessive judicial brutality in English texts because they're making the point that it's not us. They set their stories in faraway lands or in France. They really like to do that in France. At a period of time where the English are starting to define themselves more as a people separate from the connections that they have had historically with France. So very often poets will put torture in the hands of a corrupt authority, a barbarian other, that they want to demonize. And the way they demonize is specifically by saying, well, they use torture. And how barbaric is that? I think that's, that's beautiful because it is often placed in the hands of barbarians. They are the ones who are doing that, especially in saints' lives. In hagiography, you see a saint is being tortured by a terrible heathen because we wouldn't be doing this in our Christian lands, right? This awful torture. So what kind of things happen in hagiography that show this kind of torturous stuff? We see this a lot. It's a template. It, it, is a, it is a formula, especially for the virgin martyrs, the female virgin martyrs. They are the largest group of tortured saints, the ones who are tortured most often, whose bodies are open up very much to a male gaze to be ripped and torn. And the whole point is they don't feel it. They exhibit no suffering of any kind. They accept it. Very often they are tortured, healed, tortured, healed, tortured. And then finally, in order to kill one of those saints, you have to cut off their head. It's a bit like Highlander. <laughs> but 
a lot of those torments are formulaic and many of those saints may or may not have existed and the story just kind of gets rehashed and embellished and added onto as it suits the church or the churchman who's telling it the irony is is that in the 13th century where you start to see the huge collections of saints lives like the legenda aurea of jacobus de Veragine or jacobus de Voragine, the only authority that's really consistently using torture is the church itself. So what you have in these religious narratives of hagiography are these stories of young women who defy a corrupt, barbaric authority, usually emperors who are not Christian. You know, you've got in the first and second century, you've got this nasty, horrible Roman emperors, and some of them were really nasty and horrible. This is not to say that brutality didn't happen and that people didn't cross lines, because of course they did. But the stock figures in these saints' lives are those emperors who did horrible, horrible things, and the female saints resist. They stand up to them. And then they, of course, are martyred for the glory of God, and gosh, shouldn't we all behave like that? Well, in the 13th century, if your authority that is subjecting heretics to torture for their be- and martyring them for their beliefs by burning them at the stake, then this presents essentially an inadvertent model of resistance against potential corrupt church authority. So even the use of torture in something like saints' lives that was meant to be very orthodox provides narratives for heterodox people who might resist the church itself. Yeah, you can, as you say, you can read things both ways. But I thought it was interesting how you see this as being othering as much as possible, yeah. even if it doesn't always work. <laughs> right. And, and, and this this is the idea that, you know, a lot of those, and I, when I say barbarian, it's little b barbarian as an adjective, because you have to paint your enemy as, as bad as possible. You know, he's crazy with demonic rage. Otherwise, your saint doesn't look quite so pious. And (laughs) it's a model that is followed in a lot of literary texts where it's really only those who are corrupted in some way or tainted in some way who apply torture. Every once in a while, you'll have an authority figure who's good, who's just, who applies torture. And that is still critical. At that point, it becomes a mark of essentially question. Is this person really operating by justice? Are there flaws even in a system that can be just? And do good and just authorities still resort to torture in moments of desperation? Right. And this is something that you've written about before, that we're still having these conversations now. We're still having conversations about, is it just to use torture? Can you get a really a real confession out of it? And what is it meant to be used for? So do you see that it's still being applied in the same ways to get confession? Or is, is that what you're seeing when you look at torture in the modern age? I think in the modern age, it's a bit of both. It is a certain amount of revenge. It is a certain amount of frustration and desperation. Elaine Scarry very famously said that torture is the implement of unstable power structures. I'm paraphrasing, but essentially the only authorities that apply torture or judicial brutality do so because they find their grip on power to be too tenuous and they're afraid of losing that power. And so they use brutality in frustration and in anger and in vengeance because they can't think of another way to do it. And so when we see the modern application of torture or even atrocity and brutality, it's because they can't think of another way to do it. And they are unstable power structures afraid of losing that power. And you could apply that to anybody who essentially resorts to anti-Semitic or racist violence. It's the same thing because those groups, the anti-Semitic groups and the racist groups that feel threatened, they lash out and use brutality and atrocity to reaffirm a power structure that they think is slipping away from their grasp. I think that's a really good point that you could apply to the modern age and that definitely people saw as well in the Middle Ages. They saw this as being frustration and losing a grip on power. Absolutely. And kings who resorted to it were often criticized for doing so. And in fact, Richard II, who is deposed in 1399, one of the arguments against him when his cousins overthrow him, and one of them throws him into Pontefract Castle and probably starved him to death in 1400, one of their arguments was that he'd become a tyrant. 
that he'd started to contravene the foundations of English common law and that he was abusing the power of less majesty. And there is one instance of torture that's associated with his uncle, John of Gaunt, that he's tainted by that association. So a king who is going to resort to that kind of brutality doesn't have long on the throne. Exactly. And I think that's that's a really good point as well, is that the king can't necessarily do just what he wants. He has to do something that is going to show the people that he is worth keeping on the throne because people could overthrow him. So before yeah, we go... In England, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Before we go, uh, I wanted to talk about your new work, which is on treason. So tell us about this new work you're doing on treason. Well, this book is an edited collection that brings together different narratives of treason, adultery, shame, and betrayal from different areas and periods of the Middle Ages. So some of the articles go as early as the early Old English period. So texts like Beowulf and constructions of treason in the weapon exchange, texts like the Old English maxims. We have articles that deal with Castile, so Castilian Spain, with Tuscany, Germany, England, France, Old Norse Icelandic texts. We are looking at historical as well as literary narratives. And treason as a concept really only gets codified in legal processes in the 13th and 14th centuries. So the power structures in Europe start to change. And with the consolidation of power with this idea of singular kingships, rather than small kingships, individual chiefdoms, where you have a a broader loyalty to your people and your community, once you start to consolidate the power in the form of the king, then betraying that king becomes an act of treason. And the great statutes of treason in England in 1357 set out how betraying the king is treason. American statute and American constitutional statute on treason is actually based on English law. But for the Constitution, it's about betraying your country, not the individual at the head of it. So in America, if you commit treason, it's not because you've criticized the president. It's not because you have in any way spoken up against your elected representatives. It is that you have done something to betray your country, the constitution itself. And that's grounded in medieval English law. So we look at all of these different ideas of treason and where adultery becomes treason is when a woman is married to a king and commits adultery. That is not only a sexual act of betrayal, it is a state act of treason. Or in 16th century England, when if a wife murders her husband, she was often cast as a petty traitor, you know, a smaller form of treason, but treason nonetheless. So these issues of adultery, betrayal, and shame get bound up in this political entity that becomes treason and crystallizes in subsequent centuries. And I think it's it's going to be a great book for lots of reasons, one of them being that treason was the highest charge of all. And so this is, yeah, this is where it all comes down to when we're talking about punishment and torture and all these things. Treason is where it all comes together. In fact, the worst punishments, the ultimate punishments were for cases of treason. So when you think of the scene in Braveheart, when William Wallace is being executed, that's pretty much the only accurate part of the film. <laughs> there are other accurate, small accurate bits. The, the weapons are right, because I know the person who consulted on that. But the most accurate part of that film is when he's being executed for treason. And he's being partially hung up. Till he's partially strangled and then he's disemboweled while he's still alive he's castrated and then he's executed by beheading and his body is separated into quarters now that is actually what happened to william wallace and the act of being hanged drawn and quartered was the worst possible punishment for the worst possible crime and that was the betrayal of the king because the king or queen was the head of state. And in the sense of a body politic, if you betray the head, you betray the whole body. And so they ripped the body apart to punish that kind of a betrayal. Yes. And while that was accurate, it's also the very worst, as you say, and everything else pales in comparison, uh, as it should, 
<laughs> and there were really people who were subjected to that. Yes. Uh, in fact, part of the reason that William Wallace is subjected to it is because he was Scottish. Many English traitors over time, if they were noble, were simply beheaded. And so beheading was far more common as a punishment for the nobility. And hanging is actually the far more common punishment for other capital crimes like murder. But being hanged, drawn, and quartered, if you were a traitor, that was a public display not just a deterrent, but again, a reaffirmation of the power of the state. But it wasn't done all that often. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming in the podcast and talking to us about all of these things that I think we have so many different ideas about that need to be straightened out. So thank you for coming on and well, getting thank us. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Thank you. To find out more about Larissa Tracy's work, you can visit her website at mementomedievalia.com. That's memento, M-E-D-I-E-V-A-L-I-A dot com. Keep an eye out for Treason, Medieval and Early Modern Adultery, Betrayal, and Shame, which will be available from Brill later this year. As a bit of a change from the usual way we end things on the podcast, Peter isn't joining me today as the two of us spoke on a special unedited episode of the podcast earlier this week to address the devastating fire at Notre Dame Cathedral. What you'll find on medievalist.net this week are updates on the damage to Notre Dame and information on how you can help out. You can also follow medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists for more information. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist, where I'll be sharing that information too. Our best wishes go out to the people of France, and especially of Paris, as they face a new era in the history of this beloved building. As always, our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thank you for listening and for opening your minds to new information and ideas. Have a wonderful day.